every time. Every time. <laughs> Nick is like the loudest person. I swear to God. Like if we're trying to get like a countdown. He's like, oh, oh, stop. Uh, um, uh, so I'm I'm Daniel Fox. I'm I'm running some games tonight uh, with some special guests here uh, at the the Foxhole. Uh, if you will, <laughs> yeah. we have a very tender relationship. A um, very tender fox. I, I made some games, and, and we're playing some games, and and we've got a lot of fun people um, here. Who some uh, specifically one who plays normally, one who's actually the editor of Zweihander, another who was a playtester of Zweihander, and three others who are playing Zweihander actively on Twitch right now. The defenders of Kobold. Woo. From Kansas, we're a bunch of hicks from like Missouri, 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 Kansas. Kansas. We we actually kicked off our uh, our Civil War. our, yes, our meetup. Yeah. <laughs> we kicked off our meetup by doing some Mountain Ninja shit. We what? Op- we opened up a, a box of a uh, Zwei. Oh yeah, we did. we did. We yeah. did. Yeah. yeah. A video to come as soon as I figure out how to get rid of all the fucking cicadas. I might have to do that for yeah. you. Yeah, you might have to do that for me, Joe. For those of you not in the Midwest, there are a lot of. Uh, Cicadas right now. Deafening cicadas. Deafening, oh yeah. <laughs> Day and night. <laughs> that time of year. It is. It is. They're fucking assholes. That's what they are. That's right. Yeah. There's one on my door. This is pretty annoying. You should yeah. burn your house down. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. No cicadas. My that. dog will eat them, or as she's done on camera, as beaver toes. <laughs> beaver toes will eat the cicadas. <laughs> okay. She's a small but vicious cavapoo. That's her, that's her shtick. Okay. Um... So yeah, so uh, Defenders of Cobalt here. We're doing some games, uh, but we can't start the game until we hear a word from our special sponsor, which um, Jake will be talking about now. Um, well, actually, this is uh, much less of a sponsor and more of like a, a, a nice a nice cause uh, that people out there can donate their time and their efforts to. Um, <clears throat> the charity that this is for is called Toes for Tots. Children, drunks, and other shoeless souls all around the world lose a disturbing amount of toenails to stubbing, stabbings, and Macaulay Culkin home invasions every year. People come in droves to Toes for Tots for our donated selection of toenails all year round. Please visit toesfortots.org for information on how to donate your and your loved one's toes today. Together, we can make a difference. Today. <laughs> well, there's one thing we love around here is puns. Yeah. <laughs> we will also sing a lot of really silly songs. That's our thing. Uh, if Mike was here, R.I.P. Where are you, buddy? Um, if Mike was here, he'd be singing songs with me. I do that uh, because you haven't gamed with us before. I have a tendency to wildly gesticulate. I'm loud. I speak for my diaphragm. Um, and I make a lot of terrible jokes. Um, and I hope that you will join me too because this is a we're in a circle of trust, right? We're <laughs> Here to play some games. No, no better way to become friends than to kill or get killed yeah. um, with a bunch of elf games. So Yay. offense will be taken and no mercy will be given. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to start to my left. So we've got some characters that have imported over for another game, others that are randoed, completely ground up. Uh, so we'll start first with Joe. Joe, tell us about your character. All right, uh, I'm Joe from the Defenders of Cobalt, and I'm playing Brian Rundlebitch, an adult human male apothecary. Uh, he's 5'9", 170 pounds, and of a frail build. Uh, Brian has a pale or has pale skin with medium brown hair, dark green eyes, and two distinguishing marks: a farmer's tan and Remy eyes. I can't ever pronounce Ru- Rumi? it. Like- Rumi. Like, uh, eyes. it's a yeah, it's a it's a <laughs> polite way of saying that you have cataracts. Yeah. <laughs> and he was born in the spring of and is of the lowborn class and a militant upbringing. And his dooming is good intentions create bad situations. What is Grind's deepest, darkest secret? Uh, that nobody else would know. Where some of his alchemy ingredients come from, probably. Like a, like a dirty thing, or like no, a, like a murder more, thing, or more probably closer to that. Mm-hmm. It's like very low moral grounds when it comes to his work. Okay, so he's kind of a slave to his, uh, his trade. Mm. Okay, good. Jen, hi. Tell us about your character, Jen. Uh, my character is Birdie Monroe. She is a young human female high woman. 
Uh, she is 5'5", five five of a normal build. Birdie has uh, fair skin with brown eyes, or I'm sorry, brown hair and a green and blue eye. Uh, Birdie has three distinguishing marks. She's branded with a cattle iron. She has different colored eyes, a strong jaw. She was born in spring. She is of the aristocrat social class and a forgotten upbringing. Birdie's dooming is do not accept trust lightly, and her drawback is cursed. What's cursed do? Cursed. cursed. Whenever you intend to sacrifice a fortune point, roll a 1d6 chaos die. Mm. If the result is a 6, you must use two fortune points instead of one. That one's a tough one. That's one Alex has. I don't right? really use Ooh. that. It's the emergency thing. Yeah, mm. that's right. It's when the chips are down and you're like, oh, should I have cursed? Oh, no. So what happens if you have one? You can't use fortune points. Yes, oh. So it burns it before you get to use your one. They, they don't get to use it. She can't use it whatsoever. Okay. Yeah, it would simply just return to the pool. Hmm. That's the way it would work. Well, okay. When I roll the 1d6 first to figure it out? You would, yes. Okay. Yeah, before using it. Because you wouldn't, I mean, you wouldn't burn it and then be like, aha! aha! You got fucked by the dice! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the dice are gonna probably not play in your oh, favor because yeah. it's no, a role playing game. But um, but no, you would you would just wouldn't burn any fortune points at all. Be like, oh, I really need to do that, but I can't. So we'll move on to Jake. Uh, well, I'm playing a fellow by the name of Felix Hunson. He is a young human male animal tamer. He's also five foot ten, 145 pounds, and of a frail build. Felix has tan skin with medium brown hair and light brown eyes. He has zero distinguishing marks. He was born in the autumn and is of the low-born social class and of a cultured upbringing. Felix's dooming is the murder of another will herald thy death. Ooh. Has Felix come close to that dooming at any point in his in his stories and his adventures? Let's see. Yeah. Tell me something that's happened in a previous story with Felix. <clears throat> Enlighten us. He and a band of fellow travelers had happened upon a, a lovely village. And they were having a an unorthodox celebration for the harvest season. Uh, during this time, there was a guest of honor that was brought into the town that he was uh, hired to go fetch for the town. And it turns out this lady was of a, a strange pagan persuasion. So while many celebrations and pies were eaten during this festival, uh, Felix was crowned the Pumpkin King by the games masters of the of the event. Uh, unfortunately, a band of inquisitors had come to town searching for the guest of honor, and uh, in the brouhaha that followed, uh, the inquisitors were ordered to butcher everyone in the town for communing with pagans. <laughs> but it was the Pumpkin King who stood up and incited a rebellion against the inquisitors, which saved half the town, and he is unfortunately on the lamb. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. did, you lose any, did you lose any fate points in that altercation? Not in that altercation, but in a following one? Yes, he did. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we'll go next to Jeremy Jeremy Jones. Barnaby Jones. I'm going to be playing Callaway Rowan Mantle. He is an adult human and a pugilist. He is six foot three, 220 pounds, and of a husky build. Callaway has tan skin with jet black hair and piercing blue eyes. Callaway has three distinguishing marks, curly locks of hair, an embarrassing tattoo upon his face, and a pronounced brow. He was born in summer, is of the low-born social class, and of a forgotten upbringing. Callaway's dooming is the unlit path is the most dangerous, and his drawback is a bad ticker. Ah! <laughs> so tell us about your embarrassing tattoo, Callaway. <sighs> Unfortunately, I blame it upon my cousin, Credence. I have the Triss tattoo. And what is the Triss tattoo? Well, some might call it Eskimo Brothers in another world, <laughs> but it is when two men have laid with the same woman. Ah, okay. Fair Semi Brothers. Fair, Fair Semi Brothers, as you would, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. I spent some time as a soldier, and I woke up after a night carousing and had this. So next we'll go to Nick. Tell us about Clarence. Uh, Clarence is an elderly human cultist. Uh, he, he is of a slender build and has skin. That didn't say complexion there. Um, or the hair <laughs> color. Or eye color. Well, okay. I'm glad he has. Uh, he has three distinguishing marks. Uh, golden lock of hair, widow's peak, and perfect posture. 
Uh, Clarence was born in autumn and is of the burger social class with a cultured upbringing. Clarence's dooming is the abyss also gazes back. And his drawback is bleeder. Bleeder? <laughs> yes. Uh, whenever you are treated with a heal skill, a caregiver suffer, suffers an additional negative 20 base chance unless they expend an additional bandage during treatment. So you are a hemophiliac. Yes. So tell us about, tell us uh, who, so do others know that Clarence is a cultist? Does he come off that way? Is that something you advertise? Um, I'm a it's cultist. not necessarily I'm a he shouts it, but it's, he doesn't hide the fact now. He lives in the open? Yes. Okay. For good or for ill. Usually for ill. Yeah. So, forgotten gods? Forbidden gods? Uh, whoever will listen? Usually for, usually forbidden. I'd say, so, probably within your codex, there are probably filled with stories and parables of gods that have been banned by the covenant. In that case. Okay. Cool. Last but not least, Chuck, tell us about Kozel. Hey man, like I'm playing Kozel. <laughs> he's a he's like a middle aged human man. He's an old believer. He's five nine, 150 pounds, man, and like he's got tan skin and like his eyes and his hair are brown. Uh, he's got two distinguishing marks, a missing eyebrow, and I don't know where it went, man. <laughs> <laughs> and he's got he's got glasses, man, because he doesn't see so good. Uh, he was born in the summer, and he's lowborn, and is a militant upbringing because his dad was in the military, and he was a dick, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's not cool. Uh, he was born in the summer, and his dooming is beware lover scorn, but that's kind of fucked up, man, because like, he hasn't had any like lovers in a long time, man. Unless you count mushrooms, because like, those are fucking choice, dude. Uh, and his drawback is a crop ear. He doesn't hear so good, so, like, speak up. <laughs> <laughs> so, with our, our, our group of, um, <clears throat> our motley crew, so to speak, our rogues gallery, I think it's safe to assume, having come from very different backgrounds and upbringings, that uh, you're probably together because you're you're kind of like-minded in the sense that you're opportunists to some degree. You probably are operating outside of the law a little bit. Um, you probably traffic in stolen goods, maybe. Um, I wouldn't say that any of you are killers, um, but you have certainly uh, had an, an intriguing and, in, quote, adventurous life up to this point. So everyone, uh, you will gain one fate point for purposes of this story. Another thing that you should know is that we'll be playtesting some new material while we're here at the table. Um, two things we're going to do. First and foremost, uh, we're going to be using a system called the bond system. So within a group, a party, uh, characters will form bonds. Now the full mechanics haven't been fleshed out for what that really is, but for sake of playtesting and ease to play, the person across, way, across from you, across the table, you both have a bond with. <laughs> Anytime you assist with another skill test, you get two assist dice instead of one. Okay. Oh. I'll help you out, man. That's right. That's right. So, Jeremy, do me a favor real quick. Close the lid just ever so slightly so it's not drawing our attention on the laptop. Don't close it completely, though. So we can... Perfect. Perfect. Done. Yeah. All right. So yeah, you'll share a bond with the person across from you. The other thing we're going to do is, if we get into combat, um, if that is the choice that you make, not the best choice all the time, but sometimes is the only choice, um, we are going to play with multiple attacks and multiple perilous stunts. So, as an example, let's say that Kozel's like, man, get away, and like he lashes out with what kind of weapon do you have? Uh, I got a whip, man. Yeah. He, back, man! He snaps at him. If your first attack is routine and costs one action point, then you could say, I think I'll use another melee attack. Your next one's going to be standard, and your final one will be challenging. Okay. Same thing with perilous stunts. Let's say, in this case, that Birdie uh, is trying to take somebody off their feet with a takedown. 
and that test is challenging. Well, at the same time, you're like, well, now they're on the ground by takedown, and I'm also going to do a stunning blow against them. That one will be hard, and then so on and so forth. So you can use multiple parallel stunts, multiple attacks, and we're using the bond system. So that's kind of where uh, this all comes from. So the curiosity uh, from for for Chuck and Jake and Joe, did you guys play through a bit of Harvest? I think you did, mm -hmm. didn't you? Yeah, with these characters? No, with no, these ones. No, with these. Okay. That's where uh, Jabronka was. <laughs> uh, no, I did play through a bit of Harvest with Kozel for Matt. Oh, did you? Okay, yeah. cool. We're going to assume uh, that you all have only recently fled a place called Swansea. Mm -hmm. Swansea has been overrun by a group of people, for lack of a better term, that have taken the head of its head, head, headmaster, if you will, mm. or uh, no pun intended. Um, he is Maximilian Steger, and you were previously under his employ. Fortunately, you found yourself on this old barge with a man named Lutz Wassertrager, or just Lutz, his name Lutz. And you, you've, been, you've left Swansea, and you're several days out. You're probably... I would imagine it's probably late autumn, early winter. Um, the trees, leaves have begun to change color. Um, obviously, it's pretty wet. It's been raining quite a bit. The, the river you're on, the Basque River, is just kind of a, a muddy run through the wood. And you left the burning, smoldering ruin of, of Vorburg in your wake. You got there as quickly as you could. And you fell in with Lutz, and, and Lutz, much like you all, is a person who kind of lives on the edge of the law, and you have found, not necessarily maybe kinship, but perhaps uh, good employment with him, as he is actually bound for a place further downriver, um, simply called Minuet. Now, between... Swansea in Minuet is a very small port simply called Lloyd's Beacon. It's a, a trading post of a sort. And that is where your ship has embarked. It is within the, uh, it is within, the barge is within the, um, the dockyards at this point. And, and, and when I say dockyard, what I really mean is like there's literally like five or ten kind of log cabins along the side of the forest, lodges of a sort. And the docks are more like these kind of long piers are lapping against the water uh, as you as you're kind of attending to some things yourself. Lutz is bickering with one of the river wardens over uh, some some matter of coin, some matter of trade. He has to pay a tax to pass through here because the river wardens are uh, trying to ratchet down um, on travel. There seems to be some. Uh, word of difficulty further upriver, which you all know about because it's where you came from. Uh, so they're stopping all the ships that are passing through. In particular, they're looking for people who were fleeing, uh, basically people who were, were chased away from, from Warburg. But that's where we start our story, here in Lloyd's Beacon. A couple stevedores are walking around. Um, one of them is along the gangplank of the barge, loading up cargo for Lutz as Lutz is going through the roll at this point, and you all step off the, bar the barge. That's where we begin. So, Callaway. Um, yes. <laughs> you've been through Lloyd's Beacon probably before. What, what, why were you here previously? Well, I see that I wear upon myself some old military attire. I imagine I got sent wherever the people above me told me to go. So somewhere here, you've you've served maybe perhaps around this area. Perhaps there may have been a time I was doing a job much similar to those guards, man. Oh, so you mean the local Reeves? He points across the uh, the jetty, and you can see this group of men and another woman, and they're kind of walking with a slight swagger. They're not dressed in armor, so to speak, just more more or less just kind of loose clothing, a polished breastplate, and a and a conical helmet. And they seem to have command of this place, of Lloyd's Beacon, small as it may be. He relays the story to you. It's probably best if we just don't make eye contact and just give them their place. Well, yeah, that sounds perfectly fair to me. 
So for purposes of our story, the person across from you is the person you have the closest relationship with and have, have known one another, perhaps from youth, perhaps in your elder years, perhaps you met only recently, but you have a very, very close bond. So it would be safe to assume then uh, that Felix would know about Callaway's history here. I would say so. I've heard about your story of being the Pumpkin King. I've got a, I have a cousin myself who is a huge fan of tall tales. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Spread them around as much as you can. <laughs> of course. Tall tales indeed. Well, it isn't too long until Lutz has got all the cargo on board. You all are sitting on the barge. Lutz is just about to disembark. And there's this crashing sound coming from along another jetty. And your eyes can't help but turn that way because this place is so small. Um, I mean, where else would you be looking beyond the tall, sweeping, coniferous trees that are swaying slowly in the late autumn wind? Your eyes turn toward this altercation of a sort, and you see this young, wiry man stumbling forward along the jetty. And across your gangplank he goes, and he grabs a hold of Bertie's clothing as he's about to collapse. And he says, Help me. Please, they must not catch me. I have, to, I have to find a place to hide. He looks over along the far, the further end, along the other jetty over there, where you can see, you can hear some angry shouting. You haven't seen anybody coming this direction, though. He's grabbing onto your clothing with a pleading look in his eye. Uh, I'm sorry, lad, but you're getting blood all over me. <laughs> Are you doing all right? Uh, so, if you wouldn't mind, for what, what is what's what's Kozel doing in this in this situation? Man, like. Look at the water man, but then there's the trees, like, <laughs> they were like, it's like windy, man. And like, I'm okay with that. But then the dude showed up, and he looks hurt, man. Like, maybe I'll like, you know, see what he's doing, man. So a bit of navel gazing, but you were certainly kind of drawn toward his plight. Yeah. What about for Clarence? Well, it wouldn't be the first time that I... <laughs> I've been in a situation like this, so I couldn't help but <clears throat> help myself. I'll, I'm, I'm going to try to get him to a place where he can hide. What about Clarence? Oh, sorry, uh, my apologies. What about Callaway? Well, I know that some of these gentlemen here, uh, they handle things in a bit of a rough fashion, so let's at least get him someplace where we can stop the bleeding first and think about it further later. I can, like, uh... See if I can help heal him, man. Like, I'm not so bad. Kozo, you are a godsend. I'm so happy that we have met you. Yeah, man, I'm pretty great. You, yes, you are incredible. As they're, at this point, this is all kind of un unfolding, Felix, from your perspective. You, you see those three swaggering folk from before with the polished breastplate and the conical helmets. They're actually kind of looking around amid where the other cargo is a little further down along another jetty. Like almost as if perhaps they're searching for this young wiry man. What is it? How do you react to all of this? I think I'm gonna. I think if they're gonna start leading him into a like, nice little cozy hiding place, I'll approach the people with the breastplates and uh, wave my hand and say, "Oh there." You want to intercept them then? Yes. Okay, so you'll leave the barge to intercept them, just to clarify. Yes. Okay. And what about yourself, Brian? Um, I definitely take sympathy with someone that's kind of trying to hide from what's going on because we're kind of doing the same moving our way out of uh, Swansea okay um, I think I might try and assist him uh, if he's going to run up and assist so I might uh, if they're asking if where he's went or whatever I'd try and say like oh I saw him go totally the other way okay <laughs> so at we'll, so this point direction. Felix and Brian kind of actually they leave the barge you feel the the barge kind of sway a bit with their weight as they step off, and you bring this young man up on the boat, and he is pale as a ghost. Um, and he's grabbing onto his left side, where blood has clearly stained his jerkin, like just one area, you can see. You can hear this kind of faint wheezing sound, not coming from his throat, but coming from his side. You have heal, right? Yeah. Uh, go ahead and make a root, uh, sorry, an easy heal test. Uh, let's see, that's going to be 
Uh, easy heal test. I gotta get under a 65. Uh, 34. Okay. Without a doubt, uh, this man has been grievously wounded, and he is injured upon death's door. As he comes upon the boat and almost collapses on top of her, and he is he's pleading with her. Now, from the perspective of Felix and, and Grian, you all kind of begin going down toward the other jetty, and you can see these these two surly-looking fellows, and they're kind of they're at, they're kind of essentially kind of raising a ruckus with the locals. Now, have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Where'd he go? Another one you see kind of standing behind them actually has this long, slender stiletto, and he quickly hides it behind his back into his belt and pulls his cape over it. Hmm. Citizen, the man says. Uh, someone has absconded with my bag of goods. And uh, and I point off to where all the, you know, the shouting and the whatnot was from. I believe he took off that way. Uh, do you know of anybody wearing a black jerkin in the area? He looks toward, one of them looks toward you. Sergeant Winterhalder! Winterhalder! One of them calls. The man who was hiding the slender blade behind his back and tucks it into his belt begins to quickly approach and he has this he's a surly looking lout with a big old cop stash and you can hear the ringing of his of his spurs and he's clearly a knight of sort and he uh, he's, uh, he looks toward you both of you dead in the eye and says you've seen Udo Gebler I uh, wouldn't know him by name but uh, I can infer that you mean the man that ran by us in that direction he went that direction, is what you're telling me. Yeah. Yes, with the satchel of my goods. He narrows his eyes at your at your clear fib. <laughs> which of you? Which one of you wants to roll the guile test? Uh, I'll roll it, I suppose. Okay. I'm not sure. Uh, do you have do you have a skill ranking guile? I don't. Okay. Do you? Neither do I. So oh. Grind, <laughs> Grind will do his best to help, but he's not a very good. You must have a skill ring to assist, obviously. Okay. Uh, so he's kind of bl you both are basically he's blathering while you're trying to you went that way. <laughs> Your test will be secret, so you oh won't boy. know the difficulty rating. Only if you crit succeed or crit fail, otherwise it'll be known in the narrative. Sixty-three. What's your what would it be as if you were standard? If it was a standard test, what's the chance for success? Uh, Forty-six. Do you want to keep that roll? Yeah. You going to keep it? Okay. Yeah. I'll see what happens. How old is Felix? He's young. Young? Yeah. Don't lie to me, boy. Where's your ship? He says immediately. Over there? He grabs a hold of your arm. That one? That one? He's pointing toward your barge. Oh. No, that one. Oh, wait. Uh, where is our barge? <laughs> is, is there any other... Not that you can see. You know. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, I didn't think it was right. <laughs> I must have left my keys in it. Uh. <laughs> yeah. It's still running. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd probably turn, try to point at one and clearly not see that there's one there. I was like, well, it was, it was there a moment ago. It's on that slip, sir. One, yeah. of the, uh, one of the other Reeves says, and Winter Halder, the Sergeant Winter Halder says, come with me. And he has a hold of your shirt. And he's pulling you with him. All right. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the barge, this is all unfolding very, very quickly. This is all happening in parallel, in fact. At this point, literally, Grian and Felix have left. So what's happening, right, what just happened, you have no, you, you don't have perspective on that. It hasn't happened yet. So what are the three, of you, the four of you going to do? Um, I, I assume mean, somebody's going to move. That probably needs to be me. Yeah, we should at least try and hide the guy. And then my intention would be to see if I can do some sort of emergency triage to mm -hmm. keep this fucker from dying off at the start of the story. Okay. <laughs> they are getting very, very close to the ship. You come toward one of the compartments that clearly Lutz uses to smuggle goods, and you pull up the boards, and you can lay him with it inside. And at the speed of which these reeves are coming, you will not have time to treat him. Okay. They'll be here lickety split. And I'm going to set a timer for 60 seconds. I need to know what all of you are doing. Clearances. Oops. Tripping and falling in front of them in order to cause a takedown. 
So, one moment. <laughs> We're on their turn right now. This is oh, all I'm sorry. I'll remember. Okay. Knowing that they're... Man, not having time. I would say just try and help gently... So you're just like, I know we don't have time. You need 10 minutes to treat him. Fucking Christ, man. Uh, Do I you would... mind if I, if I punch you in the face? <laughs> hold that thought. I've got a, be- I've got a better... Dis- All right, hold that thought. I got I'll a be better- healing off <coughs> better my bloody distraction after carrying him. Clarence uh, takes his hat off and starts reaching deep inside. I take my... <laughs> Mutterings to himself. You son of a bitch, I know you cheated me! You rat bastard! Show me your sleeves! Show me your sleeves! I'll tear off my shirt and show you I have nothing to hide within my own! You rat bastard! You took my money! And what are you doing at this party? <laughs> oh, well, I'm gonna look off to see where the other two went. Oh, <laughs> uh, you can see them interacting with two of the Reeves and also another man who has spurs, and you can he's clearly knighted. Uh, mm-hmm. And one of them has grabbed a hold of Felix and is dragging Felix along the gangplank, or along the path. Well, then I'm gonna, gonna sashay to the edge <laughs> and be like, "Hi, nothing to see." <laughs> I don't know what you guys are doing behind me, but I'm just like, "Oh boy, the shiny uh, people are coming in." <laughs> well, the the the, man, the boy has been put at least in the hiding spot at this point, and. Kind of what's happening over here is happening there. You're coming toward the end. So I'm casting hat trick. Oh, you're under a little bit of duress. It's going to be hard. Okay. They're really close. All right. You want to channel power? Uh, let's see here. I'm going to go ahead and roll. Uh, so this is a incantation test. That's a 60% chance to succeed. That turns it to 40 with, um... Yeah, I'll channel one step. Make it Roll d6 make it make it 50. 50. Huh. And I rolled a 58, so that's a failure. And I believe you rolled a 1 as well. I did cultist. roll a 1, yes. As you pull off your shirt, suddenly Clarence's face begins to bleed from ears and nose profusely. As he kind of pulls his hand back out of his hat, and you are toward these two Reeves, and you wanted to try to take one of them off their feet. Well, my my goal was to oops trip and fall in front of the one okay. dragging me along, so I okay. to take him down with me. Okay, I'm so, I'm going to use my professional trait, uh, cult of personality, to automatically succeed. Unfortunately, you don't have time. Okay, but. We'll get back to Felix. Oh, As Felix and Grinder, Grinder are kind of walking along, you're trying to bring the Sergeant Winterhalder off his feet to buy them a little bit more time. Yeah. Uh, go ahead and make a guile test. This test will be routine. I'm going to uh, spend a fate point. No, wait, no, I can't. That's a crit fail. So. What is that? 77. 77. Oh, you grab a hold of him oh, like you're trying to kind of fake bring him down. But you don't, but he immediately kind of recognizes what's happening. And he gives you a solid <laughs> backhand to the face. Man. Oh, my face. What a jerk. Right? Level 30. That's a hit. <laughs> that's an opportunity attack. And you feel the sting of his metal gauntlet for six damage. <laughs> Get off me, boy! He says. Um, so, uh, ah, okay. <laughs> The, sol- the soldiers begin to walk <laughs> forward, leaving Felix clearly in his wake. And Grind, are you following along with them still, or uh, I'd probably be? <laughs> I don't. No, no, I'm not good at that. Uh, I'd probably be stammering behind them, also trying to mm-hmm. kind of slow. Like, oh no, that's not. No, uh, no, no, nothing to see there. Go ahead and make a guile test yourself. Okay. This will now be. Hard. Unfortunately, they haven't been able to buy you any time. Uh, as these two Reeves and the sergeant immediately come up on the ship. And the one with the big mustache demands, like, he, you look around and Lutz doesn't seem to be here at all. Like, he's nowhere near the barge. He could be in the local watering hole. You're not really sure. Maybe he's down speaking to one of the river wardens to discuss the tax. Maybe he's still 
trying to see to other things. But either way, Lutz, the owner of the barge, is not here. We knew he wasn't here beforehand, right? It's not like he's all, shit, where did it go? That's right. That's okay. right. Okay, okay. About the big handlebar mustache comes up on the ship and he says, Which, who, whose barge is this? Hey man, like, what? <laughs> whose barge is this? The other two reeves come up on the boat as well and you can feel the weight of them kind of as the boat shifts slightly. The, uh, There's a man by the name of Lutz. He's probably getting himself drunk while these lies and cheats try to steal my money. No, there's no stealing going on here, sir. There's nothing untoward at all. Wait, I man. swear they are card shops, every one of them. Do you own this barge? I'll break your face just like I did his. Over what? I mean, nobody's playing cards here. The uh, At this point, <laughs> realizing that nobody is, or they have clearly that whoever looks is not here, they're going to start rifling through the goods. They're going to start, they're going to grab the, they're looking for the lists, the roster of goods. They're going to start rifling through the captain's quarters. They're looking for, have you seen, one of them looks toward you and says, have you seen the criminal Udo Gebbler? He says to you. I'm not familiar with that name. This man, this man, as he's shaking the page in front of you. He's a wanted criminal. He was just here, he says, as he enunciates even louder. Well, if I see him, I'll kick him in the shins and throw him in your direction. You, step back, he says to the old man. <laughs> okay, what, what was the, the, was the picture on the, the paper of the person that we have? Mm. It's kind of hard to see. You just kind of shut his file. Yeah, yeah. You seem decent men and an honest line of work. If you need help moving things around, I've been on the barge for a bit. Um, you're clearly not the person in charge. One of the Reeves says. No, sir. You are. So I'm here to help you as best I can. Have you have you stolen away with Udo Gabler on your ship? He looks toward you. Specifically, looks at Bertie. She just blinks at him. <laughs> <laughs> so play dumb? Yeah. Okay. It's smile charmingly. <laughs> Go and make a charm test. Uh, this test for you will be routine. Okay. What is... Uh, 49. Ooh, barely okay. made it. Okay. He turns away from you. Sir, he's not here. One of the Reeves says. Okay. Winter Howler looks toward you, kind of brushing his mustache. You're lying to me. There'll be hell to pay. He turns upon one boot and spins around. And then he steps off the barge. Just a little bit too loudly, I say. Unless you want another one of those, those came from you. Shut your mouth! One of the other Reeves says. He has a kind of a big red mark across his face where he got slapped in the face with a with a male glove. Did you take just out of curiosity, did you go down any damage? Did you go down the damage condition? Lightly wounded. Okay. <laughs> so in the future, anytime you get down the damage condition track, just let us know. Yeah, so, okay. so everybody knows around the table. So it's clear Felix got the caught the state the backhanded sting of the, the male glove of the Reeve. Mm -hmm. And they begin to storm off and they stop and you hear them, well, you know, one of them said he may have went that way down the down the down toward the woods. Head that way. Let's go. You can start what we're saying. They will begin to search further along. Lutz kind of peeks out from behind, peeks out from behind the nearby cargo, and he's like, "We're getting the fuck out of here. I'm a wanted man." He says as he hops back on the ship and he unmoor that rope. We gotta go. We gotta go. He's saying, uh, "I want to see if I can get to that kid real quick." Okay. Uh, so he was hidden behind the planks and beneath cargo, and the boat unmoors from the water. And you pull the planks up, uh, and Lutz is like, "Go, go, go, go! Get on, get on the, get on the paddles! Go, 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 go! Pull the sail! We gotta go!" And Lutz is clearly like he's afraid. Now you can understand, like you didn't know this about Lutz, but clearly he is a wanted man in these parts. But this is the period that he was the one they were after, after some man named Udo Gebler. Mm -hmm. And as you come to the cargo hold, as the boat kind of begins slowly making its way into the swell of the river, and it quickly picks up wind, and you kind of steer the oar to continue heading down river and begins to move away from Lloyd's Beacon, you pull the planks up. 
and you find poor Udo, and he, as you pull the plank up, Kozel, uh, he gives one final groan with blood foaming from his mouth, and he breathes his last words, Mommy. And he passes. That's He's like expired. sad and shit, man. <laughs> I'll pull out a Bible and say, can anybody read? Uh, I think some I words are... Okay. <laughs> the whole thing? It's pretty big. Well, whatever part... Never mind. Just flip through a page <laughs> and put a certain timber in your voice and it'll be good enough. Uh, yeah, man. Talk about trees, dude. <laughs> I'll, I'll search for a bit for anything about a tree. Certainly. Oh, certainly. yeah. <laughs> have a holy symbol. That might help. <laughs> Lo to the trees you were born and shall pass by the earth and the salt of the wound and yeah. the glory of the custodian shall usher you to the well of souls and it's very, very deep. <laughs> and the boat kind of stirs a bit as the as it picks up on the the stream and the river and begins to it buckles for a moment as it kinda of sways back and forth and Lutz kinda of comes over and says That's Udo Gebler. He kind of like mouths instantly recognizing him almost. He leans down. No, man, he's dead. <laughs> Did you know this person? He, um, when he was a mother, he says, he kind of stands down and closes the boy's eyes. He was talking about her, man. What's happening at this point, Clarence, with you? What is your reaction to all this? Clarence is looking on, and this guy, this this man had a wound in his stomach, and he's just kind of like trying to take in what happened. Like, why would he just all of a sudden die? Mm -hmm. Did he did he bleed out? Is did something else cause his death, or what? It's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, as you kind of lean down over the body and kind of almost kind of sit it up somewhat inside the hold. You can see that the wound was pretty shallow. I mean, Kozel, you can see this too. The wound was not deep by any means. Uh, but you did hear that strange sound as you kind of peel away the cloth. You can see there's this kind of spider webs of purple veins around the wound. It looks particularly nasty. It looks as if he was poisoned. Mm. It's not good for you. Hey man, that's fucked up. Hey, you're an apothecary. What does this remind you of? Yeah, can I do a, an alchemy test to see if I absolutely can you can uh, go ahead and make a trivial alchemy test. All right, rolling pretty bad. Trivial, well, that's not too bad. Um, that is intelligence, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would have to roll. Uh, below an 87, and I rolled in 68. Okay, perfect. So, Grian, as you, you kind of take out these kind of papers, so to speak, that uh, have a tendency to interact with certain chemicals, mm -hmm. and he kind of unfolds this satchel, almost looks like a like a fisherman's tackle box, and mm -hmm. every shelf kind of opens up on another, up on another, and another, and all these different kind of bits of metal files and small chemical poultices and tiny bottles, and he and applies it to the wound, and without a doubt, he was poisoned with folk bane. Mm -hmm. And it seems strange that a, someone of so many, so few winters would be poisoned. But he was doubtlessly poisoned with a with a blade, with a knife. Probably that one we saw the guy uh, hiding behind his back. It's the widow. Which one was that? Lutz inquires. Um... Uh, it was one of the Reeves that was traveling with him, right? Or was it someone else that was... Roll scrutinized test, see if you remember. Okay. Kind of hot and heavy in the moment. Yeah. It'll be routine. Oh, boy. Okay. Uh, double zero. It's a 100. Crying, you're not really sure. You're kind of panicking there for a minute. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. After Felix kind of got cold cocked in the face of the backhand of one of the Reeves, like... It's kind of like I, your mind. I forgot his uh, name the first time no I heard it. Then after that, all I could hear was <laughs> Captain <laughs> Mustache. <Yeah. laughs> it was a person. Uh, he had a face. 
<laughs> you know it was one of the Reeves. You just don't know which one. It could have been the sergeant. It could have been one of the Reeves. You, you can't quite recall. He okay. was tucking a knife into his cloak, which is a very suspicious thing for a supposed knight to be doing. Mm-hmm. It was the, the sergeant, let's say, inquires. Yeah, sergeant... Hogan. Winter Halder, he says. Yeah, Winter Halder. Oh, he's a ripe son of a bitch, that one. Yeah, he's... Let's says. Mm-hmm. He's pretty strong, too. So what makes, uh... <clears throat> what makes uh, this guy here? You, you knew him. Why would he be running? There's a good chance he has something upon him, would be my guess. Check his pockets? Callaway leans down and begins to kind of rummage through everything that this, this boy of perhaps 15 winters had oh. passed. He was very young. And he has, of course, his jerkin, which is very, very white. He's wearing a soft pair of boots. He has a loose pair of trousers, a belt. He has clothing fit for the season, the turn from autumn to winter. Mm. Nothing else upon him save for a handful of pennies and a shilling or two. But hidden in his boot is this long, slender scroll case. Very, very small. Small enough to say... Put a note that would be small enough to put up on the ed- up around the uh, leg of a, a raven or a bird. Oh. And there's something inside. Well, well, well. Looks like something to read here, Grant. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm one of those reedy types, so <laughs> I'll take a look. See what it, it says. It simply reads, and it's very abbreviated, of course, because it must be small. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then. 144 characters or less. Yeah. Uh, oh. <laughs> you know, because you, you send, send a, a Twitter and you send, send a tweet yeah. by Raven. Um, <laughs> it says, expecting Witchstone to arrive in Minuet on the 13th aboard the, trin, the Twin Trout. And it's signed UG. Does that have a UPS tracking number on it? Or it anything? does not, unfortunately. <laughs> not. Can I scan it? <laughs> Boop. <laughs> But it, 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 it says that expecting Witchstone to arrive in Minuet on the 13th aboard the Twin Trout. Which signed UG. Like dash UG. Oh, I thought you said Eugene. <laughs> is this uh, is a Witchstone something that I would be familiar with? Is a oh, yes. Of... Absolutely you would. It is a mm. very strange stone that came from when, well... To wind back to about five years ago, in this game world, in Bahama, there is a star that was very close to this world. And for some unknown reason, it turned to cinder. It was a, the day that was called the Last Cataclysm, because doomsayers and those of Church of the Covenant thought that something terrible would befall the world after that. Seem to line up with some strange passages in the Holy Libra, the book of the, the, the Holy Book of the Covenant, but no less one. The they called it the Blood Moon when it had exploded into the sky, like in the distant, beyond the world, in the, in the, the place that they call the Outer Vault. Um, shards of it fell to the world, um, and as it fell into the world, it oxidized and turned green, um, and has been found in places. Uh, throughout the world. It is incredibly rare, um, highly prized, uh, but it has corruptive properties. It is, it is said that those who carry it, it drives them toward madness. Hmm. And it's going where we're going. Other than its rarity, is there anything that uh, people particularly want it for? Well, um, you know that those who dabble in the dark arts uh, have, a, um, have, have found uses for it. Okay. Um, but that is kind of beyond your kit. Mm-hmm. Perhaps that of Clarence. Okay. He's, he's a dabbler in the darkest of arts. Mm-hmm. Black magic. So, mm-hmm. it sounds to me we know what we don't want to stay in Minuet. <laughs> Clarence like says nothing. Money to be made in Minuet. <laughs> yep. It involves poison and armed guards. I'm not entirely sure that that's uh, that there's a cost versus reward sort of factor in my mind. Nothing to mention, nothing gain. An autumn rain begins to fall. A cold one. It's a sign. Is uh, Lutz listening on in on this? 
Yeah, I mean, the, the barge is small enough at this point, really, where you can't really hide conversation. Mm. It's a, it's a broad, broad-bellied barge with a single mast and sail, and fortunately the winds are, are in your favor, and as is the river, but um, it seems to run pretty close to the edge of the water as it laps along the side. Yeah, the, the barge is a little back heavy too with all the cargo you're taking down the minuet, mm. which is not far from here. I don't mean to sound macabre, but perhaps we don't want to arrive at the next city with a dead boy on board. We may want to find something that could weigh him down and dispose. Yeah. It's not a bad idea. Yeah, man, like, if you're going to get caught, man, don't get caught with the body still, dude. <laughs> you are wise beyond your ancient eye, Seth Kozel. Mm, you're right, man. Also, I think it might rain later, guys. We should hurry up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's if, if you're willing to... to go towards the, the shore for a moment we can uh, pick up a river rock or something and weight him down Bloods will nod solemnly it's fine it's fine some, some fine words about a tree I'm terribly sorry about the whole stab thing and turn that over starboard he says to the other boy who's on the ship and they kind of winds this kind of cranekin thing and the, the great fin behind the barge kind of turns it's about like a Five foot by fifteen foot fin that drags along the bottom of the river and kind of guides them through the muck and the mud until it comes close enough to the shore where you can hop out and it's waist deep. Uh, in your case, uh, Clarence, as you grab a big heavy rock and kind of put it up on top of the barge, and they begin their grisly work. The drizzle turns to a rain. Oh, you're right. There may be money to be made. There may also be the matter that there's people willing to murder children involved in this. Exactly. Yeah. And there's some reaping to be done. I knew I liked you, Pumpkin King. <laughs> <laughs> you're one of the good ones. Well, I might not be one of the good ones, but I don't much care for the bad ones. That's good enough for me. By the time you manage to put enough gravel and river rock in this man's pockets and tie a stone to his waist and get him in the water and disembark from the muddy shore, the rain is becoming colder and it is becoming harder. In fact, uh, it gets to the point where it's raining so hard and it's so incredibly cold you find yourself shivering beneath the, this canopy uh, on the ship and the boat is seizing back and forth. You know that you were incredibly close to Minuet. You're maybe a few hours out. But what turned was initially was just kind of a drizzle and then turned into a rain, just turned into a late autumn storm. As you can see, lightning kind of crack across the, the horizon and the uh, rumbling of the storm seems to tremble even the earth around you as the trees kind of continue, just kind of lashing back and forth with the wind as the rain is kind of going this way and that way. These very heavy curtains. And because it is that kind of late autumn storm, it's very cold. Not quite cold enough to see your breath, but just up on the very edge of it. The shift is seizing and heaving with the with the storm, and the sun is gone. It is gone already. I mean, you were departing sometime towards sundown in the first place. And because you had stopped along the edge to weigh this child down and give him a river uh, to, to, to bear him into the river um, for his uh, final rest uh, is now dark out um, and in fact one of the storm lanterns that is kind of affixed on the front of the boat is kind of rattling back and forth it's light guttering and threatening to wink out as the boat is moving through the storm and you're kind of lashing yourselves down trying to stay holding on um, as Lutz and this boy are piloting it down the river is this river broad enough to like not have any worry about running aground or anything like that? Well, uh, go ahead and roll a folklore test. Okay. Uh, this test will be challenging for you. Okay. Folklore is 45% chance to succeed. 
and I rolled a 57. That is a failure. Okay. You're not very familiar with the Basque. You know it's kind of upper branches, but not the lower branches where you're at. You're basically out in the sticks, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. You're way out in the middle of nowhere, um, but you don't really know all that well. Vorberg was a very small, tiny speck of a village where something very terrible unfolded. And uh, although Swansea is the only notable town around here, it's a town of perhaps 1,500 people. Mm -hmm. um, you'd be surprised if Lloyd's Beacon even has more than 10 people who are permanent residents. Is that a skill you can assist on for the world? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Yeah, in the future, yeah, by all means. Clarence makes his way across the boat to get right up next to Lutz and yell into his ear through the storm. Is there any way we can stop this boat? This isn't, this isn't, this isn't safe. We can't go to the edge of the river, he says, as he's pointing out. It's darkness, plumb darkness. We'll come ashore along a sandbar and we're fucked, he says, as he's kind of doing this, gesticulating. Damn, he, he, he's, he knocks his cane on the, on the, uh, the deck of the, of the boat. The boat seizes for a moment. You all are quickly shifted one, this way and that, as you all must succeed a challenging coordination test. Ooh. Six for me. Mm. Who failed? Raise your hand. Okay. You might critically fail. No, that's good. As you tap your cane against the uh, <laughs> against the uh, bottom of the or the the, 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 the the planks of the of the boat, it seems to jerk one way and jerk the other, and suddenly Kozel. And the old man Clarence are thrown off their feet onto the floor, onto the, onto the barge. The two, as you, the rest of you, can grab onto ropes or whatever you can to hold yourselves. As the storm is literally lashing back and forth, as it's fighting against you and fighting against the boat. And for a moment, you begin to think that perhaps you may not make it. Um, the storm is so terrible on this. On this river. Rumbling and crashing. And just when you think that there's. you may not live, a shaft of light pierces the darkness somewhere out further along the river. As you can see, this long beam of light kind of stretching out, almost reaching like a ghostly light, searching for those who'd be lost upon the river. That's gotta be it! Lutz says as he's kind of holding his cape over his face. Minuet! As he's pointing. And you can see this kind of dark figure upon this long jetty that stretches out into the river. This man who's clad head to toe in this gray, wet slicker with a broad hat holding a lantern. He's kind of waving his hand wildly like this, trying to bring you toward the next jetty. It would be, uh... Can I make any... Do I know that, that uh, Minuet was the only next town down the way? That's right, that's right. Yeah, and I would say probably from your perspective, Graham, both you and Kozel know these routes pretty well. It's, you know that on a good day, Menuet's maybe an hour or two away from from Lloyd's Beacon. Mm. Okay. This must be Menuet. There's no other place it could possibly be. I stand up, man, like I fell on my ass. Alright, let's uh, try and get this let's try and get this barge docked. Once in the boy, his ship hand uh, managed to pilot it safely into these docks, but not without some damage. Uh, as you hear this sliding sound underneath the boat, and you hear this cracking sound as it comes against the jetties, it crashes into it, and you all are immediately thrown off your feet. Even Lutz falls, and the boy almost f threatens to fall into the water, save for the fact that he had lashed himself near a heavy barrel as it crashes into the jetty. You can see a few other people kind of scurry out along this pier, and they grab the wet ropes, and these huge mooring ropes about the size of your arm, 
as we're kind of pulling the boat closer in, trying to get it, you know, kind of butt up against them, kind of side by side uh, in the slipper. Broken to Minuet, travelers! The man says, who is holding the huge lantern, this older looking gentleman. Grace be to the God Emperor, you made it here, you made it here safely. I'm Herman Truman, the toll keeper. Don't worry about them tolls for now, we can settle up in the morning. Come on now. He's trying to bring you all off the boat. Thanks, man. With that. I'm absolutely rushing off that sucker. Yeah, today. yeah. like, the storm's rough, man. What? He says as he's. He holds up this kind of winding, kind of conical tin ear horn. <laughs> yeah. He nods. <laughs> you want some place to stay, you said? I'll, I'll shake my head, yeah. He kind of points. One eyed Jacobs! Just down the road! He points. <laughs> Follow that corduroy road, he says. As he points where this. These, literally, these logs laying in the muck and mud that kind of wind their way through this kind of dark, not well illuminated town along the edge of the river. I said what I Jacobs, he says once again to you, Kozel, as if perhaps he's not even hearing him speak over the storm. I, I give him a thumbs up. Come on, guys, we're going to Jacobs. They want to give us quarter roads. <laughs> and I'll start walking along the road. That's it. Not going to miss those Posters off of it. You all are absolutely soaked to the bone, to the small clothes, to the socks, in fact. And the the, the trip here, although short, uh, took its toll. Uh, everyone needs to attempt, everyone needs to make, I should say, a uh, a toughness test to withstand the effects of the weather. Serving. This test is going to be standard toughness. Good. Raise your hand if you failed. Anybody critically fail? No. Those who fail, uh, the weather does indeed take its toll. Uh, as you suffer nine physical peril. Let's be down to imperiled. I am also imperiled. You're cold, you may have the sniffles. You're just feeling really uncomfortable and kind of out of place. You weren't quite ready for all this to happen as quickly as it did, as this all unfolded very, very fast within just a few hours. And through this long, twisting road, Lutz says, I'm going to talk to Herman, he says. I'm settling up tonight, Herman, he says. Herman, as he and Herman are talking about what they're going to do with the ship. I'll see you all one night, Jacobs, Lutz says. Just that way, the only building with the light on the right, Lutz says. I'm looking at it there, wanting it out of the rain. The minuet is this, for lack of a better term, um, it is literally like a small fort along the side of the river. You can see this kind of, these kind of logs have been laying into the earth and kind of almost like teeth. The only reason you can see those is the, when the lightning lashes and it flashes in the air, you can see these rough looking teeth that then meet this deep, dark, sweeping forest of pine trees. Uh, the whole place smells very aromatic and earthy. And the rain only causes it to smell even more so like that it's at the top of my day. It seems like kind of like this, this small, this lone fortress laying against the edge of a wood that is threatening to swallow them, including this broad river. If you follow this kind of winding road, and it's a very tough, tall, twisting, muddy road. It's not an easy path by any means. You find yourself slipping in the mud despite the fact that logs have been clearly split and laying into the wood at Corduroy Road, as it's known as, um, to keep, you know, as you, if, you're kind of, if you're on carriage, you hear a rumbling sound, or if you're on horse, be clop, 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 but it's to keep you from slipping in the mud and the muck, uh, because it appears that this place is also slightly swampy. Um, and you kind of head toward this winding, winding road, and following uh, Lutz's recommendation, you see this small two-story sloping building uh, with a storm lantern that seems to be shining brightly fighting against the darkness and is situated above this kind of flapping wooden sign that looks like a one-eyed jack jack of spades has been carved into it you can even from out here you can smell the aroma of bread soup hey man wine 
They're speaking my language, man. Let's go get something to eat. I'd like to get warm. Yeah, let's get something warm to eat, man. <laughs> I could also go for a dose of liquid courage. Can I borrow that handy contraption you keep upon your coats or that little metal thingy in your pocket? What, man? Thing that, oh, yeah, man. Like, I got your back, man. <laughs> You're one of the good ones, sir. You come to the door. The door is shut. It's late in the hour, and you give it up. Thank you. And the door opens, and this kind of golden bronze warmth kind of emerges out, and this big surly-looking fellow welcomes you, and he kind of eyes you up and down before he lets you in. And as you come inside, the door shuts, slamming dismissing the storm as you step into this very, very warm and inviting tavern. <sighs> the fire roars in a hearth nearby, and you're absolutely dripping wet. As you come inside, these two slender, lithe people, one a woman and one a man, they kind of saunter over with broad pearly smiles upon their face and they're both their faces are painted and they're wearing very suggestive looking clothing and one comes toward Bertie a gentleman and says I don't think that we've had the pleasure of meeting oh my. my lady I don't think we have I am Julian may I take your coat yes it's very wet we'll take your coat gingerly off your shoulders and being very pleasant and nice he will place on he place your wet overcoats uh, near a vacant table near the fire. A slender woman who is alongside him as well approaches Kozel and says, "We've met before." Yeah, man. Like v Vivian. Yeah. Perhaps you don't remember me. We'll go with that. May I take your coat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll take my my cloak and okay. hand it over. In spite of the weather, this place is rather full. A mishmash of people. Woodsmen, foresters, merchants, the local color. A few strange folk here and there. But the place smells aromatic like the wood, and in fact there's this incense burning up on top of the hearth, like the scent of myrrh and jasmine. And there are all these like standing wooden candelabras everywhere holding candles. It's very, very dimly lit, but well lit enough at least to see one another's faces. But it, everyone casts these long, kind of same striding shadows along the walls, along the ceiling, where the rafters are. The floor is plush with carpet. These heavy drapes hang in the windows. There's these beautiful golden cords wrapped around uh, the bottoms of the drapes to hold them together. There are divans everywhere. There's no benches. There's no standard tables. This does not look like any tavern you've ever come to before. There is also a number of scantily clad men and women walking around to entertain the guests. I think you need to step outside, man. Like, I no, don't think you're no, old enough, no, man. No, no, no. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm mature enough to handle all of this. All of them. Okay, man. Like, just remember, man. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take your advice into consideration. I'd be looking for any sort of surface or place of seating that I could set my stuff down and make sure nothing broke. Absolutely. I'd like to set my stuff stuff down in a place where nothing would get stolen. Oh, please, let, let me help you, Julian says, the man who helped the birdie out of her coat. Mm -hmm. A place to sit, something to drink, something to warm your stomach. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Come with me. Oh, shall I find a place for all of you? We would like to sit together. That would be lovely. That would be delightful. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. We have Actually, wonderful... if you could get a couple of these uh, scantily clad ladies to sit with us, too, that would be top notch. 
Well, here at One Eyed Jacobs, we do attend to the needs of all. Look, let us I, first understand. Let us and first, we're, and we're latecomers. That's fine. Let us first, let us first find you a place to sit. Julian says, and he's a a handsome man, although a bit rakish and dangerous looking, with a slight five o'clock shadow, uh, and this kind of this kind of crown of golden hair that falls across his 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 arms, and his face is clearly painted to draw out his better his better features. We'll find a place first for you to rest, and then we can talk about accommodations and um, entertainment. He smiles and feels. Please, if you would, may I help you, old man? Yes, please. He grabs you, but he gra- kind of grabs your hand and underneath your shoulder and says, uh, "We will find you a comfortable place to stay." It's such a strong back you have. <laughs> <laughs> he leads Clarence and everyone else in his. I'm way looking at Clarence and I'm going. Good, on. <laughs> he he takes you all to basically this kind of like round table that's kind of fitted in the corner, right? It's like you're like a bar. He's like a round table with like little kind of half open backs, and you sit down. and And he says, "Look, um, Madame Dominica is the mistress of One Eyed Jacobs. I'll have her come over and speak with you. You, um, I think she'll be intrigued." He smiles. He doesn't really go on any further what he meant by that, but he, he will turn about on one boot and says, Oh, one last thing. We do have a fine Aridane red. Can I bring that to you, at least, to begin? Yeah, man. Like, <laughs> what's a one of those? Whatever that is. It's the left. We'll you deserve one, at least one. Uh, Six yeah. cups? Yeah. You <laughs> might need a lid for his man, because he's kind of young. <laughs> You appear to That's be That's accurate and hurtful. <laughs> <laughs> he's old enough to fight for what he believes in. He's old enough to have a cup. All right, man. You find yourselves clearly in a whorehouse uh, <laughs> along the edge of the river in the middle of the storm of the night. And Julian, as he introduced himself as, will bring over a green bottle of Aridane Red, and he says... This is a 183. I'll have you know this is almost 27 years old. As he pops the cork. And as he pops the cork, you can almost feel your pockets uh, emptying from the amount of money it's going to cost you to drink this bottle tonight. <laughs> and he will begin pouring you, each of you cups and says, "I, you, You've come at such a late hour, but you should know that we here at One Eye Jacobs are open all hours of the evening. <laughs> You have not imposed upon us, I, I assure you. I don't think we call each other's names. I'm Julian. He extends his hand to shake yours. Jack. Jack? Yes. Ah. And a friend named Jack, he says. It's a true Jack and a penis. <laughs> oh, 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 I've heard that one before. As, as he's kind of talking and making small talk, this very demure looking woman in a long black dress. And and, oh, a woman of a distinguished age. She walks up and places her hand gingerly upon Julian's shoulder and says, That will be enough, Julian. Greetings, travelers, she says. She clearly has a menu in hand. I am Madame Dominica. Welcome to One Eye Jacobs. Good evening, Madame. Thank you for your hospitality. It is quite the storm outside. I trust you came from Lloyd's Beacon. Indeed. It was a rough travel. Yeah. We're glad to be here. Yeah. We were on a boat. You can hear that there are people kind of wa- being accompanied upstairs to the second floor, where you can see this wide open balustrade where men and women are disappearing in the rooms up above. Well, you should know here at One Eyed Jacobs that we attend to all tastes, no matter the hour. Surely you are famished. Perhaps we can begin with a warm soup. It seems that Julian has already brought an Aradane Red. It's a 183, I believe. Yeah, man. It's got quite a bouquet. Uh, whose name shall we put upon the check? Lutz. <laughs> Lutz Watson's Draka, she says. I yeah. think she knows it. Lutz's, <laughs> Lutz's money is no good here. Oh, man. 
Uh, I'm so glad I told him my name was Jack. I'm terribly sorry. Uh, <laughs> I said let's open it, so let's put it upon the name of Callaway Road, man. So it's only fair. I encouraged it. I will bear the cost. Very well, Master Rowan Mantle. If there's anything that I can get for you, I shall leave this here with you. She places down this wooden menu. Clunk. Please, make yourselves at home. Warm your feet by the fire. Enjoy the company. She folds her hands, going to the other once again, and the folds of her robes, her dress rather. She'll turn about with one heel, but not before that. She will give a, a glance toward Clarence with a slight smirk, a smile, and then she will leave. You should sweet talk her too. Maybe give us a good price. Things don't work like that, that around here. Yeah, man. I don't <laughs> have, for the money. have money. I'd like to look at the menu and see how much you're going to get charged for I should for know that. better than suggest things that I can't pay for, so well, it's only fair. The first thing you immediately know, Bertie, is that everything that's on this menu is priced twice as much as it would be in any other settlement. <laughs> but of course. From, bro from both the, uh, the, earthy, the earthly, such as the food and the drink and the wine, to the depraved. Uh, anything can be had upon this menu. That you would expect to find in a place of, well, for lack of a better term, Cl I Clarence sidles up and, and peers over her shoulder at the menu. Uh, oh, Julian, where's Julian? I'd like a half a soup. A half a soup. <laughs> Julian and Vivian are speaking one to one another. <laughs> Vivian has this large curls of red hair, and she's kind of smiling. And when you see her in the right light, she's big gap tooth. <laughs> like they look almost like painted harlequins. Whereas first they looked kind of welcoming and, and you know and, and and inviting to this place. When you see them in the right light, it's clear they're they're painted like clowns. Uh, they are you know he's got a paunch belly. His arms are not as toned as they would be. They're wearing makeup along their arms, charcoal to kind of show make it look like he has a six pack. Oh, he does not. Man. Um, but they are clearly painted to 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 impress, and the lights are dim enough, uh, and it kind of has that smell that you would find. It smells like spilled wine. This whole place, and the air smells a bit off. Um, and maybe it's just the fact that the, uh, the you're sitting near where the incense is, but the place just has kind of this kind of skeezy sort of feel, although. Although, when you sit up with the furniture has been stitched together and buttoned, and the buttons have popped off in place of the divans, the wood has now been well polished. The candelabras you saw are look more like phalluses uh, mm. than, than candelabras. Everything is built with the intent to suggest uh, this place is, a, is literally a whorehouse. It's a mirage. This whole place smells like Consul's coat. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> and I'll stiff my, my cloak. All right, man, you win this one. <laughs> <laughs> it's warm. We have some booze in our bellies. If you were expecting anything but tacky, I don't know what you were thinking. <laughs> if we have to pay for this, man, like, we might have to go in together, man. I can cover the bottle, and then I am going to be broke for a very long time. <laughs> I have I 28 just... pennies. <laughs> Excuse me, Jillian. My belt soon. How much is half <laughs> a soup? Oh, my dear. We don't have half soups. <laughs> How much is a whole soup? He points toward the menu. More than what your what your what your pockets can afford. <laughs> Let's order the food, man. And then more than twenty-eight. <laughs> More than twenty-eight pennies. <laughs> if you make about you make about four pennies a day, uh, what you're doing now, mm. and the price is around three pennies for a bowl of soup. Although it is a spicy soup, which has a very long list of enticing ingredients. Aphrodisiacs, right? An eel. Yeah, some snails in there. Some snails. How much would just some potato soup? <laughs> he, I'm sorry, we don't have potato soup on the menu. Really exotic around here. Do you have, do you have um, broth on the menu? 
Well, the broth is used for the soup once it's boiled off the bones, Julian says, a bit perplexed and at your questions. Oh, is it? That's icy meat. Hey. I'm going to sit by the fire for a while while you guys dish out what to have. Might I get uh, three bowls of soup and three extra bowls with spoons, of course? Julian will smile faintly, now realizing his tip will be incredibly small as he is now <laughs> sitting amid cheapskates. <laughs> and he kind of almost turns, kind of looking toward that bottle, perhaps as he's wondering, are they going to pay for this? Just but he will go away to get food. Just make it six soups. Yeah, man. We're totally good for it, man. So it's three brass per person around the table to eat this evening. So you want to split it? Huh? Sure. I was okay. Okay. from our characters that are... Or much you have, is fine. I was just trying to do the half soup Seven. method. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. you're going to charge me full price. My, my character looks like there. he has money. <laughs> he has a very expensive pocket watch on his person. He has pretty nice clothing. Mm-hmm. And kind of tries to keep himself well kept. So mm-hmm. I feel like they'd be preying on that a little man, bit. Man, we <laughs> should have put your name on the stuff, man. I'll, I'll, I'll throw in my... <laughs> I'll throw in my pennies. Uh, definitely, like, here's my 28 pennies, man, and there's maybe like seven or eight there. Yeah. I, I'd probably cover the cost of whatever is not, like, after everyone pays what they think is their share of copper, cover okay. the rest of it, even though it's still in his name. Yeah, the bottle is five gold crowns. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> I've, I've made a huge mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I've made a huge mistake. Sounds like somebody's working it out. Uh, well, the next have... risk development. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Are there guards? <laughs> Muscle? Oh, absolutely. Shit. <laughs> you, as a matter of fact, the man who let you in, this clearly a bouncer, this brutish looking fellow whose brow stoops pretty low. You're surprised to even see underneath his bushy eyebrows of his inset eyes. He kind of sits like this block of muscle upon this uh, tiny little teetering stool where he's reading this very small book intently. As people walk in, he kind of grumbles a bit and his eyes will wander watching the women as they walk across the room as he's clearly a skeezy. He's a skeezy looking dude. But he goes back. He's wearing this like is this is the most absurd vest with the sleeves cut off. But he's not muscled, he's just kind of thick. Just a slab of... Yeah, it's a slab of flesh and bone. He's big bone. Um, he's a tall Danny DeVito. Yes, he's... <laughs> <laughs> he's looking He's looking down at this book, and he looks a bit menacing in general, but he is, his eyes, every time a woman walks by, he watches them. Intently. Let's eat, man. And let's drink. And then let's eat some more. And then let's run away and blame it all on Lutz. <laughs> I don't want the food, but not that much. The thing, there was a terrible sound underneath the barge as we came upon. <sighs> I don't think that we're running anywhere anytime <laughs> soon. Unless we're running. <laughs> yeah, running, running. I hear it's really stormy out. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to, like, disparage your culture and yeah, heritage, man. but where I'm from, we don't like to run in the rain. <laughs> you know, man, I have a strict policy of only running if something's chasing you, man. I respect that policy greatly. Um... <laughs> Just imagine you going up and tagging the guy, like, running off of it. <laughs> Brian, as you're, as you're kind of talking with Julian, as you're, you're kind of working through the bill and making accounts in your head as you're thinking about how much money did I carry, how much can they actually provide, you're speaking with Julian, and you can see just kind of at the corner of your eye, there's this very young, pale-looking man who is actually, he seems to be inking something in his book, like a portrait, as his eyes turn toward... The balustrade above as he's kind of drawing this woman. Okay. Does he look like he's trying to hide himself at all, or is he just kind of out in the open painting someone? 
He's he's actually kind of in the back corner behind this kind of long, kind of semi, kind of transparent looking um, curtain that you see light through. It's very faintly woven together, more spiderweb than anything else. Yeah. And as you're kind of watching him, he looks toward you kind of alarmingly, and you can see he has this kind of Van Dyke beard, and he, like this, and he quickly takes his book and shuts it and kind of tur- stands up and begins to walk away. I'm uh, trying to make no mentally of them, but not really do anything about it. Just kind of do, that's kind of weird. He may have money. May have. A lot of these people probably. Probably money. most people other than us have money. <laughs> I'm going to get up and I'm going to start walking around the place. Okay. Going to get an account for who's around here. Yeah, I'm going to I want to see what all kind of clothes they're wearing. Um, their haircuts, that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, go ahead and make a rumor test. Uh, this test will be trivial for you. Oh, oh, yeah. Would it be untoward for him to have a wingman with him? Certainly, why not? Go ahead and join him if you will, Callaway. Go ahead and add an assist die to that. Maybe even two assist dies. So Felix and Callaway will kind of step up and begin to walk about the room. I, I was successful. Okay. As you're kind of, this is, this is all happening obviously in parallel, as you're kind of settling up with Julian, taking accounts, and you're getting your clothes kind of near the fire, and the two of you stand up, uh, you recognize that, the, that one, um, that the local color around here uh, isn't necessarily just foresters. It appears to be not people who are actually swinging the axe, but probably the ones who run the camps. Um, you see that their hands are, are, are not callous whatsoever. Uh, in fact, you, you should get an account for the people around here, mostly burgers or above. Um, you don't see anyone of lower born stock in here. And you can tell by the way they talk. I mean, their talk, their affectations, the way that they dress. There's just not really a, 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 a kind of lower class folk in here. So people with money come here to be entertained, and a lot of them speak in the local kind of dialect. You can recognize some of the accents that they have, or perhaps the way they carry themselves uh, here in Minuet. So what do you think, Callaway? You think Pocket King can convince these people to maybe uh, pony up a little dough for a party? Depends upon the type of party you're willing to offer them. Drinks on the house? <laughs> I mean, I'm quite excited to see you try. However, I'm also fearful that we may dig ourselves further into debt. Yeah. That bouncer before, who was looking at this very tiny book, is <laughs> drinking from this. <laughs> this <laughs> he's drinking from this this <laughs> bottle of booze at his side. And at some point, he simply takes a. He, he pulls a, uh, a straw from behind his ear and kind of puts it in the book and lays it down on the tiny little teetering three four legged stool and he starts and he every once in a while he'll he growls a bit the more intoxicated he becomes uh, and becomes a little grabby with the not the patrons obviously but with the women here in the uh, in the place and this is the two of you who are examining this, seeing this at this point because you're kind of walking around. Hobnobbing, rubbing shoulders of the local, the local color. I've already been slapped once before today. <laughs> Shall we make it a twofer? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> oh baby, I'm gonna slip uh, my orange painted burlap sack mask over my head. Okay. And then I'm gonna sit down next to the uh, drunk, grumbling, grabby guy. Okay. Something I can help you with, Cutter? Well, I was wondering if you would stop getting fresh with the staff. They have to entertain, after all. Well, looky here, fucking white knight. Come along to save all the women. <laughs> well, I'm not a up. white knight, sir. I am the overlord of autumn. I am the liege of leaves. The baron of bonfires. <laughs> and if you continue to sow the seeds of sin, 
I will collect on a bitter harvest. So saith the Pumpkin King. Uh, go ahead and roll an intimidate test. This test will be trivial. <laughs> now just stand behind and nod. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where is intimidate? Here it's we under Brawn. Brawn? Yeah. yeah. Trivial, you say? Yes. That is a crit success. Mighty five. words from a little boy pretending to be bigger than what he really is. What are you going to do about it, huh? I crack my whip. Whoosh. Okay. <laughs> well, a whip in a place like this would probably, or at least a crop, would probably not be unsightly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> prostitution. Just another cheese. And as this happens, <laughs> this very thin woman kind of stands beside you and kind of throws her hands down like this, and she gets brave enough to cold cock him, bam, right in the face, like full fist, pulls her full body into it, twisting and Bap! Hits this man right in the face, and he goes spinning around in front of you and hits the ground with a solid thud. As you have inspired her <laughs> to uh, to stand up for herself. Your form is exceptional. <laughs> Pivot at the hip and everything. <laughs> Marie, it worked! It really, really worked! She says as she's kind of clapping her hands. The other girls are like, you can see kind of a sigh of relief happen. I'll guy hold up her hand like a boxing champion and say, Huzzah! This guy knocked out? He's out cold on the ground. You hear him, you hear his wet thud as the man is just laying out. I run back to the table, grab the, the bottle, and put it in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> you run over and grab the bottle, you shove it in his hand as this is all unfolding. His nose just bursts with blood, like almost a minute. Bap! She, she, I mean, she, like, she hits him like like somebody who knows how to fight. Just, well, bam! Sends him spinning. Everyone's kind of staring in stunned silence <laughs> as her little balled up fist is still like this. And her face just lights up. And she's not looking at the Pumpkin King. She's looking over his diminutive height toward the balustrade where this very long-legged, tall woman is sauntering down. She has the look of a foreigner. Her skin is pink and pale with no color in it save for the rose upon her cheeks. Her hair is long and black, and unlike the other prostitutes here, it falls almost to her waist. She has these very slender green eyes that you can see even through the darkness in a hawkish nose of a northerner. Her lips are slightly pursed. And she comes over to the young girl and lays a hand gently upon her shoulder. Her, and this woman who approaches has very broad shoulders. She's very well muscled beneath what she's wearing. You work, Vivian, she says. I don't think we've had the pleasure of meeting. The Pumpkin King at your service. The Pumpkin King. That's a very colorful name, she says. Colorful like the autumn leaves, yes, I know. His spirit nearly triples his stature. <laughs> I am Marie. She takes your hand and shakes it. Roll a warfare test. A, a warfare test? Yes. Okay. This test will be trivial. Uh, let's see. Remember, if you don't have it, it's flat to fail. Yep, and I fail. <laughs> okay. I don't know, diddly about... She's a very warfare. firm grip. Mm. Although she is clearly dressed like... She is not scantily clad, um, but she is dressed provocatively. I will nod enthusiastically as I try to pretend like she's not squeezing the shit out of my hand. But clearly, Madam, your, your coaching is impeccable. She says, "Good on you." I don't think that we met before," she says very plainly. She she speaks, and when you kind of hear her accent, she's clearly not from around here. She's got a northern accent, and you know, like it's coming through immediately. Well, myself and my comrades had just come in for some soup and something nice to drink, and well, we saw some rather untoward things that this fellow was doing to your employees. I thought I'd. Make an ass of myself, frankly. 
She smiles. May we sit? Absolutely. I'll, well, I'll come. Oh, before she says anything else, I go jogging back to our table, and I'm like, guys, I think we got a free meal out of this. <laughs> That's awesome. <man. laughs> it's not he's, the meal I he's a very worried. spirited young man. She she walks over to join your table, and she doesn't have the saunter of that a that a that a man or a woman of the night would have. She walks with a very square, boxy, kind of like shouldered walk. With her, although her legs are long and she is very striking, um, she does not seem to be pouring on the charm or oozing out of her clothing as everybody else is here. Mm-hmm. She walks very plainly and comes up to your table and says, "I am Marie. Uh, I, but forgive me. If you said your name was Jack. Yes. You, as she says this, you realize she was nowhere nearby when you told the same bouncer your name, or you told Madame Dominica your name." And I say, uh, uh, yes, Jack the Pumpkin King. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest of you? She, uh, she inquires. <laughs> I'll uh, look up for my alchemy kit, which I have open. And everything seems to be safe, and you've accounted it. for everything. Okay. Yes. I'll look up for it and be like, I'm Grian. She nods. I must have. Apologize, Jack, for <laughs> I do not run this place. I've only come here just a few days ago, she says. With you. She kind of folds her arms kind of like this, and she sits with her kind of legs, not crossed, but squarely kind of like knee to knee. She has kind of school arm feel to her. <laughs> Did you come from uh, Lloyd's Beacon? It was a rough ride from there to here, but yes, ma'am. Hmm. I see. Oh, Callaway, very sorry. Oh, of course. She extends her hand, gives you a a firm handshake. And, uh, where are you from? It doesn't sound like you're from around here. Oh, she says, um, place in the north, Old Lord. I'm sure you never heard of it. I'm sure you're right. <laughs> Can I do a folklore to see if I have heard of it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you yeah. mean you need not test this at all. No. Old Lork is a town somewhere in a northern kingdom called Aglador. Uh, it is known for its numerous criminals uh, and other colorful people. Oh. Ah, a, a colorful place. I spent some number of weeks there, yes, she says, but... It is not my home. She smiles. <laughs> I spent my formative years in the holy city. Oh. So that's a... Why are you spending your current years here? Why are any of us? <laughs> Madame Dominica. You know what? That, that's a fair point. It is rainy outside. I mean, there's not really much else to do here. I mean, clearly, she's an employee. Good grip is for a good coin to be made here. Obviously, don't mean to be crude, but uh, you know. But hey, some they, people got bad backs. They could probably use a new bouncer here. You'd probably be perfect for it. Oh, she shakes her hand and smiles, playing a bit coy. I, I would make a terrible ba- <laughs> bouncer. No, Madame Dominical was kind enough to open her doors to me as I was passing through Lloyd's Beacon, and well. I, Suppose I have taken a liking to these uh, young girls and men, and uh, well, she points toward uh, the man who's laying out, who's been dragged to the kitchen. I don't think Bruno will be getting, will be playing grab ass again with young Vivian. Every good whorehouse needs a good madam. We know. I am no madam, sir. Or, excuse me, master. Fires for your last name. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't go by last name, but you can call me Clarence. Master Clarence. I'm going to lean in and go, Jack. <laughs> I must say, if she takes your lapel and straightens it, you certainly don't dress like somebody who wouldn't have a surname. As her eyes look toward your cane and back toward your eyes, you could feel her kind of like digging. I'm 
traveling incognito. <laughs> I do so by saying I'm traveling incognito. That's fantastic. As, <laughs> as you say this, you can feel the hackles kind of raising in the back of your neck, Clarence. Like something is off. Is there something wrong with that? Of course not. It's just not often that um, adherents pass through these parts. Strange choice of words. We find ourselves in a strange place. I ain't looking to make any trouble. You guys lie your trade. I may be a man of the cloth, but I'm willing to look the other way. She leans back, and you can see around her neck, Bertie, the flash of a holy symbol, but you're not really sure what it is, but it looks a little bit too fancy for somebody who would be a prostitute. Mm. Well, I should hope that you enjoy your stay at One-Eyed Jacob's. She stands. It's a pleasure to meet you all. Uh, we'd enjoy it a little more, if maybe a complimentary round of drinks and some soup would be handed our way. I believe she puts her finger to her lips. What would be only be appropriate for a place such as this would be, as they call the locals call it, schnapps. Uh, you hear these people? Schnapp! 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 <laughs> Suddenly, the whole place <laughs> opens up in like this song. Everybody! Everyone begins singing this like old folk tale about schnapps. As it's almost like a trigger word for these people uh, here <laughs> in Minuet. And then suddenly, Julian and Vivian, the people who had welcomed you before, are bringing out these small jacks, these Peter jacks full of spirits. To everybody. Ooh. It is only appropriate, I suppose. She claps her hands, and the, uh, of course, they begin to pass out bottles of schnapps, or shots of schnapps. For, for everybody. This is all right, man. I like, gotta say, I'm, I'm quite happy to have made your friendship. <laughs> I'm gonna pick up the first one that, that's handed to me, hold it up to, for everyone to see, then take it down. Okay. <laughs> the food is very warm and inviting. The strange pale-faced fellow with the dark robes and the book, you don't see again for the rest of the night. He seems to slip away. Your clothes are drying by the hearth. Do any of you want to stay up this evening? Actually, uh, before going to bed, I would want to mention that strange person to, uh, what was her name that was talking about Marie? this? Marie? Marie, yeah. It's like, uh, do you know anything about this man? I'm trying to recount as much uh, detail as I got on the space. It's going to be, uh, sketching something. Hmm. She, um, I'm not one to stir the pot, she says. And I wouldn't trust that one. His name's Zacharias. One of the locals. She's very curt with her answer and says no more. Okay. No less. You intend to stay here in Minuet? She inquires of you. Uh, for the time being, at least until this storm passes. I don't know how much business we have here. Hmm. I'm sure we'll drop something up. Well, let me give you a quick bit of advice. Brutes, such as the one who Vivian knocked out earlier, and those two fellows over there, she points toward these men with these very thick curly hair shaped like triangles, beyond like a <laughs> 70s rocker hair. They work for a local racketeer named Bruno Connard. Rough looking fellows. Rough trade, she says as well. I stay away. But should you find yourselves in the company of brutes, you'll find them at a place called Sigmund's Flask. It's a dog fighting pet. <laughs> Enjoy your stay, she says. 
She kind of walks away with this kind of boxy looking kind of stride. I'll pull a tiny tin crown out of my bag of supplies and she'll smile. You're an entertainer. <laughs> Born and raised. So, any of you wish to stay up this evening? Stay up. I'll do a few joy schnapps with my people. Drink <laughs> that uh, evening? No, I'll, I'll probably tuck in, you know, after some, some schnapps and me. You know, not think about the bill too much. <laughs> worry about that in the morning. What are yourself, Bertie? Uh, yeah, I'm going to sleep. Okay, Brian? Yeah, I feel like I'd be pretty exhausted after uh, everything that's happened today. I'd want to turn in. Felix? I'm going to go as long as I can on the whole schnapps routine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what about yourself? He's a Palo young lad with no limits. <laughs> <laughs> no limits, soldier? Or none that he's found yet, unfortunately. I will remember my limits because a man needs to know his limitations. However, I will not leave Jack <laughs> by himself. I will try to be a good and appropriate wingman and keep himself into too much trouble. Clarence, is it past the hour for you? Yes, he's an old, old feller. I did not partake of the schnapps. Okay. That's okay. Kind of Felix partook <laughs> of it I'm quite handily. <laughs> so I believe that means Felix, Callaway, and um, Kozel will be up this evening. Will you partake in the other type of entertainment this evening? <laughs> Someone to warm your bed. <laughs> Something to spoon with tonight. No, man. A little spoon with tonight. Callaway? No, no. Felix? He'll say, yeah, sure, and won't remember that he said, yeah, sure. Okay. So Anyone else? He'll, he'll like probably that? just go right to sleep. Okay. Well, regardless, this evening, Kozel, or sorry, uh, my apologies, Felix, you'll get lucky. Oh, boy. So you get a fortune point that only you can oh, use. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Ooh! <laughs> <laughs> And you will bed down for the evening and we'll take a break 